Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Study UK Facebook Live Q&A session. My name is Jenna Hartzell, and I'm the Education Manager for the British Council at USA. Today's session, we will focus on everything related to the undergraduate application um, for UK universities. Whether you are a student considering applying to the UK or a counselor or a parent of a student who is embarking on their application process, uh, we hope this Facebook Live will give you some useful information to start and help you um, to solve any questions you might already have. Uh, the chat for today's Facebook Live is open to share opinions and information related to the session's topic today. Our aim is to create a safe environment for everyone. We encourage diver divergence of perspectives, but we do not tolerate bullying, harassment, or discrimination against other members of the chat or the speakers. If you want to reach out regarding any concern, please write us um, in the email that we'll share in the chat. We thank you for your participation in today's Facebook Live and for your commitment to creating a safe and respectful environment for everyone. For today's session, we are excited to be joined by Melissa Cunningham, Senior International Officer for the University of Strathclyde, Tony Dolby, International Officer for the University of Sheffield, and Frankie Hunt, Regional Manager for Europe and the Americas for the University of Reading. They will be helping us to answer all of your questions. Hi, Melissa, Tony, and Frankie. Thank you for being with us today. Hi there. Thank you for having us. Um, we encourage everyone joining us, please type in your questions in the comments and we will answer as many as we can get to during this one hour session. To start off, please feel free to say hi in the comments. Let us know where you're joining from and if you're joining us as a counselor, um, student or parent. We will share our contact information in the chat in case you have a question that doesn't get answered during our session and you want to follow up with us. So in just a moment, we will get to your questions about applying to an undergraduate degree in the UK. Um, but first, I'd like the reps who are joining us today to tell us a little bit about their universities. Um, so we'll start with you, Melissa, and then we'll go to Tony and then Frankie. But Melissa, could you tell us a little bit about your university, including where it's based and what international students can expect um, there? Sure thing. Thanks very much, Jenna. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to join you all this afternoon, certainly this afternoon in Glasgow. So by way of introduction, then, my, my name is Melissa Cunningham. I am Senior International Officer at the University of Strathclyde which is um, based in Glasgow, as you can probably tell from my accent, in Scotland. So the University of Strathclyde itself, we're a medium-sized institution. We're about 23,000 students from over 100 different countries. So we have quite a diverse student population. We're situated in the downtown area of Glasgow, which is the biggest city in Scotland. Glasgow itself is about a 45 minute um, bus or train ride from Edinburgh, which is the capital of Scotland. And we're about a four hour train ride from London or an hour's flight as well. So it's very easy to get to Glasgow um, from the US. Very easy as well to, to travel around. And that's something that students really love about our centralized location as well. Students can often um, find themselves traveling in and around Scotland or in and around the UK on a weekend. And certainly we have Glasgow International Airport, which is a 20 minute drive from the university. So it's quite easy to, to travel around Europe as, as well. Um, in terms of the university itself, so we were founded in 1796, uh, over 200 years ago. Um, we were founded as the, the place of useful learning. So a lot of what goes into um, the, the kind of teaching aspect of our, of our university, a lot of that is um, integrated with um, practical elements as well. We work a lot with industry to make sure that students have the skills that will help them uh, once they graduate and, and uh, set off into the working world. We were voted Times Higher Education, or rather we won Times Higher Education, 
Times Higher Education UK University of the Year in 2019 and also in 2012. So currently we are the only UK university to have won this award twice. Um, currently we have 24 subject areas within the UK at top 10 as well. So um, that's really a, a kind of whistle stop tour of our, of our university. And I'm looking forward to answering some of your, your questions later on as well. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and we will be sharing the um, website pages for each of the universities. If you know your interest is peaked and you'd like to go learn more about uh, the University of Strathclyde, we'll share the website for that um, and a contact a little bit later in the session as well. Um, so we can now go to Tony. Yep. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. So as Jenna mentioned, my name is Tony, and I'm the International Recruitment Officer at the University of Sheffield. So let's tell you a little bit about the University of Sheffield. We are a world's top 100 university, um, and we're also a member of the Russell Group. Um, so if you've not heard of what the Russell Group is before, it is a group of leading UK universities um, that are focused on research. Um, so we're really good universities to come to. It's kind of similar to the Ivy League in the US, if you kind of had to describe it. Um, and at the University of Sheffield, we have five different faculties. Um, so we have the faculties of medicine, dentistry and health, arts and humanities, social sciences, sciences and engineering. So we offer a broad range of subjects. Uh, we have around 29,000 students um, from 150 different countries across the world. So we really are um, an international university. If you've not heard of Sheffield, then that is pretty common. Uh, not many people have heard of us, but Sheffield is actually the fourth largest city in England. Um, so it is located in the north of England, in the county of Yorkshire. Um, and what's great about the University of Sheffield is we are very close to one of the largest national parks in, um, in England, which is called the Peak District. So by coming to Sheffield, you will get that mixture of city life with all the normal amenities that you would expect. Um, but you'll also get that kind of typical British countryside vibe if you're interested in going hiking um, and walking and, and being outdoors. Um, Sheffield has the best students union um, in the UK for the last four years. So a really great university to come to, um, lots of clubs and societies for you to join. Um, and the city of Sheffield is really friendly and lively. There's lots of things to get involved in. It's very welcoming to international students. And it has also been voted the cheapest city in the UK, um, according to the NatWest Student Living Index 2020-21. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, and as Melissa mentioned, very much happy to, to answer your questions later on. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Tony. Um, we'll also share the webpage for the University of Sheffield if you'd like to go and take a look and learn more. Um, for those who are just joining us, um, we are answering all of your questions about applying to an undergraduate degree at a UK university. Um, so we do uh, encourage you to drop any questions that you have in the chat. Also, let us know where you're joining us from. Um, and we're hearing from each of our UK university reps joining us today um, to hear a little bit about their university and what international students can expect. Um, so Frankie, um, we'll come to you. Could you let us know a little bit more about um, the University of Reading and what international students can expect when um, they arrive there? Sure, no problem. Well, thank you, everyone. It's uh, be really nice to meet all of you and to speak to you in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, I'm Frankie. I'm the Regional Manager for Student Recruitment from Europe and the Americas at the University of Reading. So if you haven't heard of the University of Reading, uh, we are in the southeast of the UK and we're a relatively large town and we have about 300,000 people uh, that live in the Reading and Greater Reading area. So we're a campus university and we're originally a country estate that belonged to a member of English nobility. We acquired the estate in the 1960s. This means that we have a lot of historical buildings on campus. So our school of law was the original manor house, looks over the lake, so that's very beautiful. Um, so as you mentioned the lake, um, it, it takes up quite a large amount of the campus. We have a lot of wildlife as well, so lots of uh, squirrels and baby birds. 
uh, particularly in the spring, which is always really lovely. So it's a very nice place to spend your time. We also have a botanical gardens on campus. We have a large amount of woodland and green open spaces and a lot of playing fields if you're interested in sport as well. So we are quite close to London. We're about 22 minutes by direct train from London Paddington, which is right in the centre of London. And you can also get to London Heathrow International Airport in about 40 minutes by car. So it's very easy if you do want to fly um, back home uh, or if you want to fly out to Europe, you can either do so from London Heathrow Airport or you can also do it from London Gatwick International Airport, which is where a lot of the um, low budget airlines tend to fly out of. And that is about an hour and a half, so about 90 minutes away as well. So we are also quite an old university. We originally founded in 1897 as a University of Oxford Extension College, and then we gained our Royal Charter, becoming the University of Reading in 1926. We've got really long history of welcoming international students like yourselves. Um, we originally had our first international student all the way back in 1908, and that was a, a student that came to study agriculture with us from Kenya. So we've in total have had um, students from 180 different countries and 150,000 people since our beginning that we've educated. So hopefully um, you'll be interested in becoming one of them. And if you do have any questions a bit later about any of the content of the talk or about the University of Reading, then I'm more than happy to help. Thank you so much, Frankie. Um, we've dropped each of the university's web pages in the chat, so please do go check those out um, and learn more about these um, exciting universities in the UK. Um, now we're um, going to get to some questions. So I see we've already got one in the chat. So thanks for uh, kicking us off, Mar Marsha, with the questions. Um, we encourage everyone, please add any questions you have in the chat. We'll also be sharing contact details at the end if you have any questions you'd like to uh, address directly to any of the UK reps joining us today. Um, so, uh, Melissa, I think starting, um, starting with the university search process, and then maybe you could also take us into the application process in terms of timeline. Um, what would you recommend uh, to students, you know, when they should start researching UK universities um, and their courses, and then when they should be thinking about applying? Yes, yeah, certainly. Thanks, Janet. Well, we, we often have students from the US who um, begin to start thinking about what they want to do in their in their junior year. But I've met so many students and their parents um, as well who have even started to search much, much earlier than that. Um, there's loads of ways to, um, to, to find out about the universities in the UK. Um, loads of resources as well. And it can, I, I appreciate it can be quite overwhelming, but use the resources and take some time as well to, to go through everything. I would say um, the British Council obviously has a plethora of information on their on their web pages. And the good thing about the British Council's website as well is um, the search facility, which is always really good. Obviously, there is a breakdown of all of the universities in the UK. So you can find out about every university in the UK, find out um, all the statistics when the universities were founded. You can find out about the university specialisations as well. Um, and you can also search by city or by region. So that's something that as a student, you might want to, to think about as well. Um, thinking about the application process as well. So you may have heard of something called UCAS, which is um, the, the UK um, centralised application system. And again, through UCAS, they also, so it's UCAS.com, they also have a, a great search facility as well, listing all of the UK universities. Um, and you can search by city and there are wonderful city guides on UCAS as well. So you're maybe trying to think in, in a few years before you, you finish, you graduate school and you want to then go on to, to college university. You may be thinking about, um, what kind of subjects interest you? What kind of sized 
institution do you want to go to? Whether what what's a good fit in terms of the location as well? And all of these things then will filter into the different searches that you do. And then of course you can go into the, the university's website, you can search loads of, of information on social media as well. All of the universities are on YouTube and Instagram and LinkedIn and, and there are always really great videos as well on the university's web pages um, of student testimonials, for example, students, current students um, uh, relating their own experience as well. So do as much research as you can beforehand. And one other thing that I, I must mention as well is um, thinking in terms of, I suppose, how long you want to study for um, and how you want to study as well. So in the UK, um, Scotland's education system is slightly different to that of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, so England, Wales and Northern Ireland have three years of study at university, whereas Scotland has four years. So the American, the US system is actually modelled on the Scottish system. So again, this might be something that, that you want to think about. Do you want to study maybe a more kind of specialised degree area? In which case, maybe the three year structure is more suited to, to that. Or are you maybe someone who is maybe all quite well rounded or you're not entirely too sure what you want to study? The Scottish system, certainly for liberal arts and business is quite flexible in the first two years of study. So you can maybe pick and choose different subjects before you decide what you want to major in. So that's something again that, that you would want to factor into when you're searching for universities as well, what's the best fit in terms of, the, in terms of these subject areas. And just to, to um, answer your questions as well, Janet, um, in terms of like the timeline of the application, um, so again, you want to double check these with your university reps and you want to check this on UCAS as well. Some certain subject areas do have um, an earlier application deadline. So if you're thinking about applying to some professional subject areas, such as um, medicine, dentistry, um, veterinary medicine as well, these have a deadline usually um, at the institutions which teach them in October before the, um, before the next year, the September start when you will be beginning your studies. Um, if you're thinking of maybe arts courses as well, um, design courses, those might have a, an earlier deadline as well. I think January, February time. Jenna, you can correct me there if, if I'm wrong. Um, a lot of the universities will have a general deadline. Um, certainly at the University of Strathclyde, our deadline is um, June, the end of June, right before September start. So if you're thinking about applying, and we have rolling admissions as well, a lot of UK universities have that. So you can apply anytime really um, between September up until um, the end of June before the next September start date. Great. Thank you so much, Melissa, um, for walking us through what students should be keeping in mind as they're researching which universities to apply to, and then also the application deadline um, or application timeline for U.S. students. Um, and I think that's a great point to check out um, UCAS, so it's uh, just U-C-A-S. Um, they have a page that breaks down the application um, timeline for students in a really uh, easy format. So um, I would, you know, recommend uh, referring to that as well. When you're looking at specific universities, you can also check with your reps. Like Melissa said, um, sometimes there's a general deadline on the UCAS website in January, but many UK universities will accept international student applications um, well beyond that deadline into, into June, like uh, Melissa mentioned. Um, so it's worth checking with the university reps that um, your students are working with as well. Um, so I know, Melissa, you touched a little bit on how students can look for a best fit university for them. And um, Tony, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on what students should keep in mind when they're looking for a best fit course for them in the UK. Yeah, thank you very much. So obviously, depending on what stage you are within your research and what grade you're in um, at the moment in high school 
This will slightly depend on, you know, where to begin. If you're completely at the beginning of the process in figuring out which course to go to, which university to go to, um, as Melissa mentioned, there's so many good resources out there. Um, but first of all, I'd start thinking about, you know, where do you see yourself going after your studies? Do you have a particular job in mind that you want to go into? If the answer to that is yes, then um, you might want to kind of track back from there. So if you want to be an architect, for example, do you need to have a degree in architecture to be able to study that career? Um, so that's a good place to start if you kind of know where you want to go to um, later on in life and, and career wise. If you're completely stuck and you don't know what you want to do for a job, which is absolutely totally fine. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I left high school. I was still totally confused. Um, so what I did was I looked at, you know, the kind of subjects that I really enjoyed in my studies um, and the ones that I felt that I was good at, you know, getting good grades in. Because um, obviously if you've got a passion for a subject, if you are interested in that subject, then, you know, you're likely to, to go further in it. Um, and really enjoy the time. Obviously, it is about coming to university, it's about getting that knowledge um, and that experience within your subject um, to hopefully help you get a career or um, progress academically um, into the future. So they're the two things that I'd say to start thinking and looking about at if you're not kind of 100% sure what you want to do, where you want to go. Um, if you have got a subject or a subject area in mind that you want to do, um, then some of the things that you could start looking at to find a best fit course for yourself. Um, so like Melissa mentioned, look at the length of the university, the length of the course that you want to go to. Um, as Melissa said, in Scotland, it's four years. In the UK, most bachelor's degrees are three years long. Um, I would also look at the modules and the assessment types for each course. So every course um, or degree will have a different types of modules and these will vary per institution um, so you know if you've got a really specific area that you're interested in then look at which institutions offer that in their modules um, similarly with assessment types universities will assess you in various different ways that could be everything from exams to group projects to essays um, and if you have a, a preference in how you like to be assessed, then maybe see if the universities that you're interested in lean more towards a certain way than the other. Um, it's also worth looking at if you're interested in kind of getting more international experience while you're studying your degree. So if you're coming to the UK, that's obviously great international experience. Um, but some universities might offer the option for you to do a year in industry or a study abroad option which could then enhance your international experience. So for example, you could go and work in a company, whether that be in the UK or overseas, or you could study abroad in another institution that we have partnerships with across the globe. Um, and another final thing to start looking at when trying to find a best course for you is look at the accreditations offered. So some um, universities and some degrees will offer accreditation. Um, so that is normally with a certain body um, or organisation that is relevant to that course. So, for example, if you're thinking of doing psychology, um, some universities will offer degrees that are accredited by the British Psychological Society. So it's worth thinking about those accreditations. Do you need that? Um, will that be useful for you to have, you know, going into your career studies? Um, and they're just kind of some top tips of things to start thinking about. Um, obviously, you can check all the web pages on, on the um, British Council website um, and obviously speak to the us as international recruitment officers. Ask us, you know, what do we offer? Speak to the departments, get in touch with as many people as you can and do as much research as possible. Fantastic. I think yeah, that's really great guidance, I think, especially for those students who are you know, just starting out on that process of figuring out what they want to study at university and then where they want to study. So um, those were some really helpful tips. Um, thank you so much, Tony. Um, so it looks like we've got some questions coming into the chat. And for anyone just joining us, we're going through some questions uh, about applying to an under, undergraduate degree at a UK university. And we have some UK university reps here today joining us to help answer those questions. Um, so I think we'll go to um, 
Barbara's question in the chat, um, and this is something I think it might be useful to hear from uh, each of the reps. Um, if you have a comment on this, you know, from your university's perspective, that might help to give the audience an idea of, you know, from your university, if admission requirements have changed related to testing, such as the SAT or AP, as a result of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so is there, um, uh, Tony or Frankie or Melissa, would anyone like to, to start with that one? And then we can go to each person um, to get your university's perspective. I can start for Reading. And um, so obviously we're aware it's been a difficult year for students um, and it's been particularly difficult with regards to standardised testing. Um, so I am aware that these, well, originally we would take either free subject-based SATs at Reading in place of the equivalent of UK A-levels, or we would take three um, advanced placements, so APs, in place of those A-levels, otherwise students will potentially need to take a foundation year. I'm aware that the subject tests aren't continuing in the US um, after this year, so it would just be the advanced placements that we'd be looking for. We would still require students to take advanced placements to make sure that they're at the same level as the UK students who'd be entering, um, but we have tried to be as flexible as we could with our grade requirements. So similarly to how we've been quite flexible to UK students this year and tried to take into account the difficult year that they'd had, um, we've also tried to be as flexible as we can with regards to the APs that we would require from students. And of course, if a student um, really doesn't meet our minimum grade threshold, then they can also consider a foundation year. I can see there are quite a lot of questions about foundation years that are starting to come through, but I'll let us get to those. And can always provide more information about the type of foundation offerings that we have at our different universities as well. Great, thanks, Frankie. Um, Melissa or Tony, would you like to add anything on that from your university's perspective in terms of admission requirements changing related to standardized testing as a result of COVID-19? Yeah, I'm happy to to jump in next. Um, so yeah, as Similar to Frankie has mentioned, we're trying to be as flexible as possible at the University of Sheffield. We are still currently reviewing our entry requirements for 2020-22. Um, but similar to Frankie mentioned, obviously the SAT subject tests are no longer available. So we will be looking at students that um, are taking APs. Um, but, you know, we can look at applications on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and if there are other relevant um, qualifications or um, study that the student has done such as maybe honours level classes um, the ACT or the SAT then we may be able to look into that um, to accept that in lieu of the three APs that we would normally ask for um, but it can be done on a case-by-case case basis. Thank you Tony and Melissa would you have anything to add um, for that question? Sure, Jenna, thank you. Um, yes, very similar as well. So the University of Strathclyde last year adopted a test flexible um, entry requirements policy. And again, we're, we're looking to hopefully implement that for 2022 as well. So again, in lieu of um, APs, um, if students haven't been able to sit any APs um, because of the pandemic, and obviously the situation with the SCT subject tests as well, we're, we're well aware of that. So we will, um, we can look at um, high school transcripts as well on a case by case basis, have a look at um, any other academics that students have, if they've been doing honours classes or AP classes as well, we will take all of those into consideration. So again, I think for, for us, it is a case, don't, don't be afraid to get in touch with myself or my colleagues in the US team. We're happy to have a look at transcripts as well, happy to discuss individual cases um, and we work very close with our um, academic selectors and our admissions team at the university. So um, get in touch and, and we can certainly have a look into um, your questions in terms of academics. Thank you. Thanks everyone for your response on that. And thank you, Barbara, for the question. Um, I know that's very top of mind for, for students applying um, right now. So um, thank you everyone. I see, like you mentioned, Frankie, I think foundation year is definitely a topic of interest coming up in the chat in several different questions. Um, so I think it might be useful for us just 
to chat a little bit about a uh, foundation your programs. Um, again, we could, you know, come to to each of you. If, you know, Frankie, you mentioned you have foundation your programs. You can expand upon that. Um, I know many universities in the UK do offer foundation your programs, um, and I think if we could touch on, you know, why a student would take a foundation year, would you? typically recommend those for students, um, you know, applying, you know, from certain countries, certain international students, you know, U.S. students included, um, and where students could go to maybe find out more about those requirements. I see there's some questions about, you know, looking at the requirements on UCAS, but then maybe the requirements were a little bit different um, than what was um, listed there. Um, so maybe we could, you know, start Start with you, Frankie, and then um, Melissa and Tony, if you want to come in on that to, to talk about your foundation, your programs as well. Okay, no problem. So um, here at Reading, we have a couple of different types of foundation programs, actually. I think it's worth saying, first of all, with foundation programs, if for any reason you don't have advanced placements and you're being asked to consider a foundation program, um, well, the university degrees in England are three years. So with the foundation year, that would actually take you to four years. Um, which would be um, the same length of degree program as you would be taking in the US. So don't make necessarily treat it as studying for extra time. It's just making sure that we get you up to the same standard as the other students and that you're really prepared for the type of course that it is that you're going to be doing. So we do have what we call an international foundation program here at Reading. Um, students choose different pathways depending on the course that they're looking to do. And often if you're not quite sure when you're coming in, you could pick, for example, a science pathway, and that would actually qualify you for any of the science degree programs. So it is quite a lot of flexibility, a little bit like some of your first years might be in the US actually, where you're taking a few courses and trying to get more familiar um, with what it is that you would want to major in. Um, so we also have uh, some other pathway providers that we work with. If you wanted to do a, a drama theater um, type of program, then we work with a company called CEG and you'd be studying on campus, um, but um, it would just be run by a slightly different company. And so every university will have a different type of foundation program that they offer and different entry requirements for those. And it works a little bit differently to UCAS as well. So as Melissa mentioned, UCAS is a centralized application system. So you can apply to lots of different universities just with one application. For foundation years, um, you can apply through UCAS, but you could also apply directly to the university. So the application process can work slightly differently as well. I'm happy to answer any additional questions on our international foundation program or indeed the pathway foundation programs that we offer through CEG um, but probably let the other university reps talk a little bit about their foundation program offering as well because it could be quite different to mine as we're all quite different institutions. Thank you Frankie. Um, I guess um, Melissa uh, we could come to you and if you'd like to talk a little bit about um, Strathclyde's uh, if you have any uh, foundation programs or pathway programs. Available. Yeah, yeah, sure. So yeah, so at the University of Strathclyde, we do have foundation programs um, available. So um, we at Strathclyde have four faculty. So we have our Strathclyde Business School, our Faculty of Engineering, Faculty of Science and Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences. So with the foundation, we actually have two pathways. So we have one pathway, which is for humanities and social sciences and business, and the other pathways for programs within um, engineering and science. Um, so, so similar um, to, to what Frankie was, was talking about beforehand as well. So if you're interested in a, in a science program, for example, you would take the, the science foundation pathway and upon successful completion of that, that would permit you um, to, to study um, various science courses at Strathclyde. You apply directly um, to our International Study Centre at Strathclyde. So you would not make the the application through UCAS for our foundation programs. Um, check our web pages. There is lots of information about our International Study Centre, mm -hmm. which um, which has our foundation programs there. You'll find loads of information. The International Stud Study Centre is on the University of Strathclyde campus. So our students who study the foundation, they are treated exactly as a Strathclyde student is. They have access to all of Strathclyde's facilities as well. 
And doing a foundation at Strathclyde, um, upon successful completion of that, you would be permitted direct entry to year two of most of our degree programmes. So you'd still be studying the four years as is common in Scotland. So yeah, happy to, to answer any kind of specific questions about our foundation programmes if you, if you want to email me separately um, after this session. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, as we can come to uh, to you, Tony, if you could share with us a little bit about um, Sheffield's um, foundation year offerings. Yep. So we do have um, an international foundation year offered at the University of Sheffield. Um, this is offered through our um, international college. Again, it's based on campus similar to Strathclyde. You'd be treated as a University of Sheffield student. Um, the way that the application process works is you, is you would di apply directly to the international college that we have with at the university um, and choose your pathway, similar to what Frankie mentioned. Um, and then once you've successfully completed your pathway, you would go directly on to studying at the University of Sheffield. You wouldn't need to make a separate application. Um, so you just make the one application to the study centre um, and progress through as, as, as you would. Um, also, depending on the type of qualifications that you're taking um, within your high school, then there are there might be other options available to you. So some of our degree options that we offer at the University of Sheffield um, do have a foundation year included in them. Um, so many of our engineering and science courses have an integrated foundation year in them. Um, so these are typically for students who have either taken the correct subjects but not achieved the right grades, um, or they've just not taken the right subjects, but they are taking a qualification that we would accept for direct entry onto one of our courses. Um, so, for example, if you're taking the International Baccalaureate, then a degree with a foundation year might be um, available for you if you don't meet the right subject levels or the right grades within them. Um, for those courses, you would apply directly to UCAS, um, but again, it's worth checking with the representatives of the universities that you're interested in. We can give you more advice and guidance on what route would be most suitable um, for your students or for you um, based on what qualifications you're taking. Um, so hopefully that helps answer some, some of your questions. Um, and oh, I did see actually in the chat, if you do apply directly to a course with us via UCAS, um, and you don't meet the requirements for that and the international college option is the best suit for you, then our admissions um, team will let you know that. So they would send you a, a rejection email, um, but they would also prompt you to visit the international college web pages to find out more information about studying the international foundation year first. Great. Thank you, Tony. And thanks, everyone, um, for that information on the lots of different options around foundation year programs and pathway programs in the UK, um, which can be a really great fit for certain students. Um, we will share the contact information for the reps here today at the end of the session. So if you do have more detailed questions about the foundation year programs at their schools, uh, please do follow up with them. Um, and I saw also an Amy's question about if students are taking a, a foundation year program at a particular university if they would go on to study at that university typically. Um, in my experience and knowledge of the foundation year programs, I believe that's true that typically you would stick with that university, but um, Melissa, Tony, Frankie, um, do you know of programs where you would study at one university and then you would go to another or is it typically you would stay at the same, same one once you enter that foundation year route? So um, I think you're right in that typically students do stay with the university because they've enjoyed studying there. Um, they feel a lot more integrated into the student community. So we really do treat our foundation students as full-time students, the same as our other students within um, our academic community. But sometimes students might choose to study a foundation year at one university and move to another. It really depends on the student and what it is that they're looking for. Um, so for Reading, um, I think about 80% of the students that take our foundation program do stay and um, it can just be to do with the type of course that it is that they want to go and do and we do have a very highly renowned and accredited um, foundation program at Reading and we were one of the first foundation programs 
that was offered in the UK. So we do have a minority of students that come and study the foundation with us because they know that it gives them entry to a lot of different universities and they know that they'll get a very high quality of education and they then might move on to a different university that offers a course that perhaps we don't quite offer at Reading. So yes, most of them do stay with us um, because uh, thankfully they do quite like studying with us after the year, but sometimes students do choose to go off to different universities afterwards and we're perfectly happy for students to do that. On that, I would mention like, additionally, if you are choose, thinking of doing a foundation year at one university and then potentially changing to another university afterwards, it's worth checking with the university that you're hoping to change to if they accept the foundation year that you are doing or that you've previously done, as depending on the institution, they might not accept every foundation year from every provider. Um, so it's worth checking that information with the university that you're hoping to go to. Um, just to make sure that they will accept what you've done um, and if it's relevant for the, for the degree that you're hoping to go into. Thank you. Those are really useful points. Thanks. Um, so I think we'll go into talking a little bit more about the actual application in terms of, you know, what students should plan to include in the application and then some tips on writing the personal statement. I saw a question in the chat about if a student is applying to different types of courses, how they would manage that in their personal statement. Um, so I think if we could include, um, or go to, sorry, go to you, Tony, um, if you could talk a little bit about what students should plan to include in their application, and then we'll go on to talking about the personal statement. And then um, I see we have a couple other questions in the chat we'll also try to get to um, before the hour is up. Yeah, thank you. So I would say that the UCAS application is divided into four sections. Um, so the first section is about your personal details. So that is where you will input everything about your name, your personal history. Um, and that is where you will also choose the courses or degrees that you're interested in studying. The second section is all about your academics. So what school have you attended? What courses have you taken? What grades have you already achieved? or if you're still studying at the time of applying, then what are your predicted grades? Um, and that will also, the second section also includes information about your employment history. So if you've had a job or a part-time job, uh, then that is where you can add information about that into the UCAS application. Um, the third section is about the personal statement. So I'll not say any more, I'll leave you in suspense for, for when we go on to talking about that in a, in a while. Um, and then the fourth section is all about a reference. So this is a reference from um, normally from a tutor um, or a staff member that um, you have classes with in your school. It might also be your college counsellor. Um, so they would submit a reference on your behalf. Um, and then once that's all filled out, um, then you can pay and submit your application uh, via UCAS. So there's kind of four main sections to look at again. There's lots of information out there on the UCAS website, which is probably the best place to, to look for guidance about how to go about and what to include in your application and, and all those sorts of top tips. Thanks, Tony. That's a great breakdown of the different sections. Um, and like Tony mentioned, the UCAS website has a wealth of um, further detailed information on each of those sections um, that you and your students can check out. Um, so I think we'll go next to um, Frankie um, to talk a little bit about the personal statement and we can get to um, the question about, you know, if you're looking at applying to slightly different courses or quite different courses, how you would manage that in your personal statement. And then um, Melissa, we'll come to you after that. Um, if you could touch on uh, Amy's question about speaking to uh, student support systems at UK universities and how universities support um, students with different kinds of um, uh, learning support needs. Um, so Frank, if we could come to you on um, what are your tips when students are approaching the personal statement, you know, what they should include, maybe not include, um, and what should they focus on? Sure, no problem. So um, it's worth saying UK personal statements can be a little bit different to US personal statements. Uh, whilst it is a statement about you and it's our way of getting to know you as a potential student at our university, we are looking for them to be weighted slightly differently. So 
we're looking for your personal statement to be about 75% to 80% about uh, your well, academic qualities. So uh, why it is you're looking to uh, study your chosen subject, why it is you're looking to come to the university, what is it that made you choose that subject, what career aspirations you have in that area. And the other uh, 20 to 25% is the personal side of it. So we're looking to find out more about you, about your extracurricular activities and experiences that you've had that you think are relevant to the degree program that you've chosen. So the first tip I have would be to make sure that you plan it quite effectively. Um, a really good way to start would be to make a long list of all of your achievements and your goals. Um, think about work experience that you've had. Have you attended any subject tasters? Have you been to any open days? And get all of that down on paper before you then start cutting that down and working out what it is that you want to include in that personal statement. So really, you want to make sure that you keep everything you put in there very relevant. It's quite easy um, to start listing things in your personal statement. But once you've done the list, forget about putting stuff in a list. You want to get it down into a really coherent personal statement and that you'd be happy to share with all of the universities that you're applying to. So you only have 4,000 characters in your personal statement. There's no formatting um, as part of it. So it really does need to be very concise. Um, and you need to use concise language as well to make sure that you can get the most amount of information in as possible. With that in mind, I would say um, not to include any quotes. Um, these do take up a lot of space in your personal statement. And whilst it can be very tempting to put a quote in and demonstrate, um, well, I guess, your wider reading, ultimately the personal statement is about you. And we want to hear what you've got to say, not what somebody else has got to say. And the last tip I'd really give, although I feel like I could talk about personal statements forever, <laughs> really, and give lots of information on what to put in. Um, is just to get loads of people to read it, get your friends to read it, your teachers to read it, your parents to read it. There's no spell check feature in your personal statement. So you want to make sure there are no spelling or grammatical errors that the admissions tutors are going to read. And just to make sure that um, it's the best personal statement that you could submit, because it is your chance to make yourself stand out as a student candidate um, amongst other students that might have very similar grades to you from um, other backgrounds. So um, yeah, you want to make sure that it's uh, relevant, it's concise, and that it's demonstrating what type of student that you'll be and why we should offer you a place over another student with a similar academic background. Yeah, that's great. Lots of useful tips um, for students approaching the personal statement and how it's different from a typical uh, US personal statement. Um, and do you have any tips for students who, um, so for those uh, in the audience who might not know, when a student submits an application through UCAS, they'll be applying to up to five different courses, and that one personal statement will go to all of the five different um, universities that the student is applying to. Um, so it's important, like Frankie was saying, really just to focus on, you know, the subject and what the um, why the student wants to study that subject. But if a student is applying to slightly different courses at two different universities, um, how would you suggest they approach that in their personal statement? I would say definitely don't name the university to start <laughs> with, because uh, you are applying to up to five different universities. It's not often as much of a problem as students think, because students by this point tend to have decided really what subject it is they want to study. So any courses that you would be applying to would be in a similar academic area. And we also have joint honours degree courses in the UK. For example, I studied English and German at university. And then I made sure that my personal statement had about a 50-50 split. Um, and I, you can also talk about um, something that might join the two of them. For example, I talked about German literature because uh, that linked the German and English sides together quite nicely and allowed me to make sure I was covering both areas. Universities do know that you're applying to multiple uh, institutions, most likely. Um, so if you're personal statement does start discussing something slightly off topic, they're probably not really going to hold that against you. But um, it does need to be broadly applicable to everything that you're applying to. So I wouldn't necessarily name individual course titles or modules. Um, you want to make sure that it's as broadly applicable to everything you're applying to as possible. But typically, as I said at the start, students tend to apply to very similar courses or at least complementary courses. So it should be quite easy for you to be able to cover those. Um, once you start writing it down, I think it will be easier than you think it would be. Yeah, those are great tips. And I think also, yeah, opens up the topic around for counselors and students to consider, you know, in the UK, students can look at studying, you know, a single subject, but there are also um, joint 
sort of joint courses and combined courses available as well. So I see in the chat, um, you know, Jacqueline, with your student looking at a student is thinking about applying to law and writing, you know, maybe there would be a, a combined or joint course that would combine those two um, those two topics or like Frankie mentioned, maybe finding that overlap between law and writing that the student could focus on in their personal statement. But um, Melissa or Tony, did you have anything to add around the personal statement tips on um, for students on that? Um, I would just say just, just really what Frankie had mentioned as well um, in the beginning is don't get too bogged down by it. Like Frankie mentioned, there are going to be common denominators within the subject areas that you are applying to. So maybe take a step back from it and think about this, your skill set. You know, I, I, specifically to uh, Jacqueline, I think's question about law and creative writing, but what exactly are the students' skills within those? And you could talk about that a little bit in the, in the personal statement, rather than talking all about legal studies, for example, or all about um, creative writing. So um, I think it is quite, because it is so different to, to writing um, um, your, your kind of, the, the, the similar personal statement, um, in the US, you might panic a little bit or it might be a little bit daunting. Preparation is key to it. And also take advantage of all of the, the UCAS resources as well. There are loads of um, tips about the personal statement and um, video tutorials as well on the UCAS website. Great, thank you. Um, so I think uh, unless Tony, unless you had anything to add, then um, I think we can go, um, we'll stay with you, Melissa, on um, going to Amy's question around um, speaking to needs of various kinds of learners and um, types of support systems in the UK. I know UK universities have really robust uh, support systems for students, so it'd be great to hear um, more about that. Yeah, that's such a, such a really good question, Amy. Thank you for that. Um, I know specifically at the University of, Scla of Strathclyde, I know that we have our own um, disability and wellbeing services. Um, and there is a, a section, perhaps it's a tick box or perhaps it's a, it's a little kind of free text box on the UCAS application, I think, where if you do require additional support needs, you can put that down in the on the UCAS application, I think. Um, and that, if, if that application is going to um, University of Strathclyde, and I'm sure for other universities as well, quite often, um, if we, if our admissions team is alerted that students will need additional support, they would then get in touch directly with the student to discuss those individual circumstances. Um, more broadly, at all UK universities, pretty much, there is impeccable, like uh, just so much student support out there. Please do not be afraid to reach out. We, as I mentioned at Strathclyde, we have a, a disability and wellbeing service. Um, we do, we work a lot with um, students on peer-to-peer -peer support. We have um, specific workshops available as well. So that could be um, academic writing workshops, that could be math skills workshops, for example. Um, there are other things that we put in place as well, as do lots of lots of UK universities. So if you maybe require specialised equipment, um, we can fund that as well. So. There's loads and loads of different um, different things that are available for students. It's it, it's giving you that that um, that impetus to to reach out to us. Don't don't be scared. We do have these things in place for students, and we can work with with you or with your your parent guardian, with your counsellor as well, to make sure that all of these um, all, all all of these requirements are put in place for you. We want to make sure that students are comfortable coming to study with us and that they have all of the tools available to, to be successful, to have fun as a student as well. Great, thank you, Melissa. Um, and we'll, like I mentioned before, we'll share the contact details for the reps um, here today and um, you know, going on to, to other universities' websites as well, looking at the international office, if you have specific um, student cases in mind that you want to get in touch with the universities about, 
um, they'd be able to, to let you know about the specific support available for that student. Um, so I see we're, we're at our five minute mark for the one hour session, but we have a few more really great questions in the chat to get to. So we'll try to get to those um, in these remaining minutes. I think um, I saw a question in the chat about housing, which I think would be great to touch on a little bit. And then also coming uh, to Amy's questions around uh, predicted grades, um, which I know can be something different between the US and the UK university application systems. Um, and also who is reading the personal statement. So maybe um, we'll stick with the application questions and then we'll come to housing um, at the end if that uh, sounds good to everyone. Um, so Tony, if we could come to you about, um, could you tell us how um, you advise counselors on pre entering predicted grades, um, especially if that's something they're not familiar with doing with their um, students who are applying to US universities? Yeah, thank you. That's a really, a really good question. So, um, I mean, I would say there's a lot of advice and guidance on the UCAS website to start with about how to provide predicted grades. Um, and we do see applications come through sometimes where there's just been no information completed about their education history or their studies. Um, obviously, you should try and put in as much information as possible about the school, about the curriculum that's followed. Um, and if the student, what subjects the student is taking, um, at least as a basis if predicted grades aren't available. Um, if an application is completed and there's submitted, sorry, and there's not enough information for us to make an assessment on it, then our admissions staff will get in touch, um, you know, to ask for more information um, and to see if there's something additional that you can provide um, to help us make an assessment on the application. Um, but Personally, at Sheffield, I think we look at each application on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so if there's no predictor grades given, then do let us know. Um, your student can obviously contact us directly, and then we can take it from there to see what would be the best course of action um, for that particular case. Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, before we move on, uh, Frankie or Melissa, did you have an, any other tips for counselors who are looking at entering predicted grades? I'd say what you can always do is you can always contact the university admissions team directly. So we've had similar situations like this before. We understand that the system is quite different. It can be a little bit confusing, um, particularly if it's, for example, the only UCAS form that you're having to complete for your um, class that year. Um, so you can try and fill it in as best that you can, but you can then also send the students grades so far to the university admissions office. Um, UCAS isn't the only way that we can get information about your students. If after the application has been submitted and you have an application number, you can then send the students um, transcripts so far to um, the university. They'll be able to add that information to their file and it will allow them to make a more a well-rounded decision about that student rather than, um, for example, rejecting the student when um, we actually should have been a student where we should have been considering giving them an offer just because we didn't have enough information. But similarly to Sheffield, um, if we don't have that bit of information, it's missing, the um, admissions office would reach out um, to the student or the nominated contact and ask them for a little bit more information so we can make an informed decision. Great, yes. thank you. Oh. Sorry, sorry, no, Jada. Please, no, please go ahead, Melissa. Um, just very quickly because I am aware of time, but I would yeah. I would add to that 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 might be um where you see the conditional and unconditional offers and the difference between that as well. So at Strathclyde again, it's very similar. We would work on the grades that the student already has. Um, and so if we think that they meet the requirements um, based on what they already have, we would likely give that student a conditional offer. The condition being that we are waiting on maybe their, their final year grades. Um, and then we would wait until, so the conditional offer means that we are holding a place for that student until that time, of course, when they can submit their final grades to us. So again, don't get too bogged down about predicted grades as well as, as Frankie had mentioned, get in touch with the individual reps at the universities or the individual admissions teams as well. And you can certainly, I'm sure, um, send in the student's current transcript and, and work from there on it. Great, thanks. And then I guess just quickly, um, 
Staying with you, Melissa, who would you say typically reads the personal statements that students are submitting? Um, would that be someone like in based in the on the academic side of the university or an admissions representative? Yeah, it, it actually depends on institution. I've, I've worked myself for a couple of Scottish institutions where for some institutions, it might be the, the academic selector. Um, so it could be the professor for that particular course. Um, it could be a centralised admissions team as well. It could be departmental um, admissions teams as well. So it really does depend on, on the university who reads the personal statement. Um, but it, that's not to any, uh, any student's disadvantage as, as to who reads it. Whoever is reading it is well versed and well trained on what they, they require from the personal statement and certainly the grades that they require as well from the student. Great, thanks. Um, so I know we're at the hour. I think we'll go just a little bit over with a quick round robin around um, with our reps here today. If, um, it'd be great to hear, you know, maybe just a sentence or two on um, your housing offers for students. I know the question that in the chat was particularly curious about housing for the foundation year students, but I think it'd be great just to hear, you know, in general, what housing offers you have for international students. And then maybe um, if you'd also like to leave us just with your top tip for uh, students and counselors um, looking at applying to UK universities. So um, I think if we start um, with you, Frankie, and then we'll go to Tony and then um, to Melissa to wrap up the session. Oh, so here at Reading, I mentioned in my introduction, actually, we are a campus university, and that means that we have quite a large amount of campus accommodation available. Um, so all of our accommodation is either on the campus itself or within about a 10 to 15 minute walk maximum from the main campus buildings. So with um, international students and indeed all undergraduate students, actually, as long as you apply for accommodation by the 1st of August on the year you're coming to join us and you meet all your conditions by the end of the month, then you are guaranteed accommodation for your first year. Um, students can reapply in their second and third year for accommodation if they'd like to. Um, but a lot of students do like to go off and move into houses with their friends or flats with their friends. Um, it's entirely up to them. Uh, but I came back into halls in my final year. Um, so it is an option that's available to students. Talking about um, kind of the last top tip to leave, um, I guess it would just be to not rush it. Um, unless you're applying to a course that closes really soon. Um, I appreciate, of course, we've got the October deadline coming up for um, students who are wanting to apply to certain courses for 2022. For those of your students, which will be most of them that are looking towards that January deadline, they do have quite a bit of time left um, in which to submit their personal statement. It's an equal consideration deadline, which means that as long as we receive their applications by that deadline, all applications will be considered um, the same. So there's no particular advantage to students rushing their personal statement and their application and applying earlier in the cycle. So just take your time and make sure that it's best application that you could possibly submit. And then all of those applications will be looked at after that equal consideration deadline, whether that's in the October deadline or it's in the January deadline. Thank you, Frankie. Um, we'll come to you, Tony, for your, uh, yeah, what housing you have for international students and your top top tip for students and counselors. Yeah, thank you. So similarly to Frankie mentioned, we guarantee accommodation for international students at the University of Sheffield. Um, and we do have accommodation on campus. Um, so there's two different locations to choose from. Um, and you can select that, obviously, once you've been given an offer to study with us. Um, for any students doing the International Foundation Year in our international college, we do have separate accommodation for them. Um, so you would stay within the accommodation for the International College during your International Foundation Year and with other students on the from the college. Uh, and then once you progress onto your degree programme, then in year one, you would move into the university accommodation sites. Um, to give you a top tip, I'd say re do as much research as possible, read as much information as you can on the UCAS website, um, reach out to as many people as you can. Um, and if you're thinking about which course to choose, which university to choose, then um, most universities will have the option for you to chat to current students, um, whether that be on their website or you can also do it via UCAS. Um, so that's a great way to find out a student per student perspective and ask some of those questions that you might be a little bit more 
afraid of asking um, an academic or a staff member and you know you can really find out those personal personal things about each university and each course. Okay, thank you so much Tony uh, and we'll come to you Melissa for um, what housing is available at Strathclyde for international students in your top tip. Sure so yes we do have on campus housing at Strathclyde for you know, um, for undergraduate students. Um, it's apartment style living, you'll find this very typical in the UK. So you, you don't room share, um, you have your own bedroom, but you will usually share kitchen and bathroom facilities. Um, at Strathclyde, I mean, just um, similar to what the, the other reps were saying as well. So generally students tend to, to move out at, at the end of their first year. Glasgow being quite a big city, a big student city as well, there are lots of um, private student accommodation providers in the city. So that could be another option for you. Um, and there are always um, apartments that are available as well once you move out of your student accommodation um, and you, you're sharing um, an apartment with those who you met in your first year and who you lived with. And in terms of, of top tips as well, um, I would just add to that is do as much research as you possibly can. Go on the individual universities' web pages. I think I mentioned this at the start, but there, there's so much now that we all do in terms of social media. TikTok has become a huge thing as well. It's always quite nice to, to go onto YouTube and TikTok and have a look at fun student videos, find out what the... Um, student life is like what the university atmosphere is is like as well and you'll you'll find the best fit for you um i know as a lot of things are opening up now um travel is is um we, we, we can avail a little bit more of travel um so it might be that you might be able to visit um campuses in person but if not most if not all universities are um doing virtual visits and um virtual webinars as well for um, prospective students so make sure that you do sign up for those as well take advantage of um all, all the virtual stuff that's going on at the moment to find out more information thank you so much um Melissa and Tony and Frankie for um, all of your um, advice and guidance on these questions um, and your top tips for uh, students looking to apply and counselors who are advising those students. Um, thank you to our audience today, everyone who joined us for your fantastic questions. We really appreciate it. And we hope that this was a really useful session for you. Um, we're sharing the contact information for the university reps who joined us on the screen, so please do feel um, free to reach out to them. Um, Melissa was here um, for Ashley today at Strathclyde, but um, we do uh, encourage you to please reach out um, to these university reps with any follow-up questions. Um, on behalf of the British Council, the University of Reading, the University of Strathclyde, and the University of Sheffield, we want to say thank you for joining us and remember to stay tuned to our Facebook page for our next Facebook Live Q&A. We hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.